Hi everyone, Brooke Rogers here, Interpretive Specialist for the University Museums. Thanks for joining us on this virtual art walk. Uh, I'm so excited that you've decided to join me. Under normal circumstances, the University Museums holds this program monthly and we are able to discuss a few artworks based on a theme in the Art on Campus collection. We have over 2,500 works in this collection. Uh, so obviously we can't see them all, so that's why we focus on just a few. And with all those artworks, we are actually one of the largest public art campuses in the United States. With so many art or great artworks to see, uh, these walks give us a chance to explore how these masterpieces came to be, how a particular artist or work of art influences the direction of our collection, and examine the visual aspects of each of the artworks. The theme of today's tour is Earth Day. Uh, although it is no longer Earth Day while we're recording this, and by the time you see this, uh, Earth Day will have passed, but I can argue that every day is Earth Day. Uh, this was specifically a celebration of its 50th anniversary, uh, so really quite remarkable um, that we've been celebrating Earth Day for the last 50 years. Uh, today the artists will be focusing on, um, in the Art on Campus collection, use nature and the environment as central messages of their work. So in case you're unfamiliar with Earth Day for some odd reason, I found out some of its history. Uh, so it's actually started really critical conversations about conservation that we're having today, uh, as well as our relationship with the Earth, its flora, its fauna, and how we use its natural resources. Earth Day was a united response to the environmental crises, such as oil spills, smog, rivers polluted that they literally caught on fire, and other environmental horrors. On April 22nd, 1970, 20 million Americans then roughly 10% of the U.S. population at the time, took to the streets, college campuses, and hundreds of cities protested environmental ignorance and demanded a new way forward for our planet. As I mentioned earlier, Earth Day is credited with launching the modern environmental movement and is now recognized as the planet's largest civic event, according to the Earth Day website. The works of art that we will see today each have a unique viewpoint on how we relate, engage, and think of nature. So let's get started. All right, so we are now on the third floor of Parks Library, and we are in a study area, which is currently empty since the library is closed. Uh, but I wanted to show you guys one of my favorite artworks here at Parks, which is done by Rachel Sussman uh, called La Ureta, and it is a 47 by 57 inch portrait photograph of something that might look digitally rendered um, as if somebody photoshopped an unusually bright green, uh, maybe a sea coral-esque thing into the middle of a muted a desert scene. Uh, but that very green splotch is actually a real organism um, and it is called a La Yoreta. Uh, over the course of 10 years, Rachel Sussman produced her project called The Oldest Living Things in the World, and she was able to research, travel, and document continuously living organisms that are at least 2,000 years of age and older. Uh, Sussman's goal for the project was part art, part science, and to elevate the environment and its natural components. She aimed to create a space where the view can escape our quotidian experience of time and start to consider a deeper time scale. In selecting 2,000 years as the minimum age, we have an opportunity to start at what we consider year zero of time and work back. Uh, La Ureta is just one of these species chosen for this project. So there's um, multiple other photographs in this series that deal with other subject matter. But the one we have here at Parks is La Ureta, which is Spanish for compact. Uh, and this is a densely growing flowering plant native to South America. It grows in the Puna grasslands of the Andes in Peru, uh, Bolivia, northern Chile, and western Argentina at latitudes between 10,500 feet and 17,220 feet. For comparison, Ames is only about 
942 feet above sea level. So we're talking really high up um, in the mountains here. Um, and this is where winds are blown unceasingly and they're cold um, and even able to crack granite. So it's a very um, stress-inducing environment. Uh, these plants are actually self-fertile flowers. Uh, the self-fertile flowers are pollinated by insects and grow in nutritionally poor soils in which the plants wax colored leaves grow into an extremely compact dense mat, so dense in fact that it could hold the weight of a human. So if I wanted to lay my body across this for whatever reason, could uh, and it would be able to support my weight which is pretty remarkable. Uh, the plant keeps growing to the ground and it helps to reduce uh, heat and water loss which is really important to conserve um, in such a arid environment. Uh, it is estimated that these plants only grow about one and a half centimeters per year. Because the the plant is so dry and dense it burns well like peat and has been traditionally used as a fuel, uh, the amount of the plant that is now removed has become so significant uh, that it threatens the very existence of the plant. La Ureta is now a protected species and since it is such a slow grower it has made it to the endangered species list. Kath Clear, who is an associate professor of biology at Regis University, has done three studies on the species in Chile. Uh, Chile's national park, one of Chile's national parks, and says that there's a still there's still a lot we don't know. There could be a potential for more ethnobotanical uses. Uh, she says that she's recently found some research that people have been testing this the um, chemical components of this plant, and it's been found to have some anti-cancer and HIV fighting properties. Sussman's approach is really quite unique uh, since she use, uses this as a portrait uh, of a plant. And she said that, I approach my subjects as individuals of whom I'm making portraits. In order to facilitate an anthropomorphic connection to a deep time scale, otherwise too psychologically challenging for our brains to internalize. Reconciling the brevity of human life with the ancientness of nature asks us to consider relationships to our environment. Sussman is a Guggenheim, NYFA, and McDonald Colony Fellow and a two-time TED speaker. Uh, in 2014, she began on doing installation work of personal and cosmic space and has been working with SpaceX, NASA, and CERN. So very interested in the collaboration between science and art. Uh, and finally, closer to home, the Des Moines Art Center also has some work done by Sussman. So we're here on the second floor of Parks Library, kind of tucked in between some uh, bookcases and some workstations. Uh, Parks Library is currently closed, so it's very quiet here, uh, which provides us a really nice opportunity to look at these two, uh, what look like photographs, but are actually oil paintings done by Tilly Woodward. Uh, we also have a third that is not seen here, so today we'll just focus on these two. Uh, at the top, we have Birthday Nest, and then below that, we have Cooper's Curb Chain and Nest. Uh, I am particularly drawn towards the Cooper's Curb Chain and Nest, so that's the one I'm going to focus on today. Um, since I'm up close, I can really see um, a lot of details. Like I mentioned, it almost looks like a photograph from far away. But as I get closer and move my head just a few inches, the light really starts to change what I can see. So uh, getting close, I can see just the little dipples of the paintbrush. Um, I can see kind of the 3D nature of the paint on top of that really, really um, black paint. Uh, so everything on top of that really pops like it's almost 3D. Um, in the nest, it's empty, but I can see that it's made of some sort of grass. Um, it's very thin grass, so maybe it's also hair. I don't know what bird this nest comes from, but I can tell it's fairly small. Uh, both of these paintings are about 11 by 9 inches, so pretty, pretty small uh, dimensions. So 
I'm guessing that we're looking at a smaller nest. Um, it does look like I could just cup it in my hands and I can picture the birds um, popping out of their eggs and chirping at us. Uh, just a few inches below the bird's nest is a chain. Um, according to the title, it's a curb chain, as my guess. Uh, so we just have a single link of chains uh, that are just kind of interlocked together. And then there's one that is off on the top. Um, so instead of having it as just a complete row, there's also sort of like column nature to it. Um, the background is a pure black, so everything that is on top of that black really just juts forward. Um, and I can't help but to think about the relationship between the chain and the nest. Uh, obviously the nest is made by birds, so there's something very natural about it, very organic. While uh, we have the chain, which is something made by man, um, and the fact that it is oddly so perfect, um, it looks like a real chain, um, just the way Tilly is able to capture the light to give us that sense of 3D um, is pretty remarkable. And the fact that, you know, we have this sort of connection between humans and nature going on. So really inspired by what she's doing here. And by close observation, I'm able to see all of those details. Uh, details are a huge part of Tilly's artwork, um, and she's also very interested in human connection to nature. Uh, the desire for close looking developed at an early age for Tilly. Uh, she spent a childhood on an isolated family farm, uh, which provided her with many opportunities and long hours to gaze at the sky, earth, and animals and plants. Um, although she no longer lives on a farm, she still incorporates wildness and nature into her daily life. On her website, I found a funny thing that she had mentioned, that she lives um, with the selection of beautiful trees and bushes, as well as flowers that she tries not to kill, and has a legal and beautiful chicken coop. So I thought that was really, really quite fun. Um, her days now are obviously busier than she was a child, but she still spends a lot of time just looking and observing at things closely. On why close looking is influential to her process and artwork, she says, There is so much that is uncertain in the world. I find it a comfort to take time to see one thing clearly, or a part of one thing clearly, each day. I think of what I would do as what I do as witnessing. I believe in art as a method of sharing information, initiating communication, and enabling relationships between individuals and communities. I paint what I see. It feels right to look closely and to celebrate objects through observation, meditation, and documentation, giving voice to their inherent meaning and beauty. Northern Renaissance paintings are particularly interesting to me. I like the attention to detail and how objects are laden with meaning. The things I paint are symbolic of my life, people past and living, family, loved ones, our history together, people I would like to honor, in awe of the forces of nature. I love oil paint, the way it smells, the way it moves, the way it captures color and light. I work on paper mounted to panel because I like the quality of the surface and the ease of moving from drawing to painting. I love the idea of painting as the accumulation of small actions. These are Tilly's words. Tilly is a curator of academic and community outreach at Grinnell College Faulkner's Gallery. Her works have been exhibited in more than 191 museums and galleries nationally and can be found in museums, corporate and private collections all throughout the globe. She is the recipient of numerous grants and awards, including two fellowships for drawing from the National Endowment for the Arts. She graduated from Phillips Academy, Andover, and holds a BFA from Kansas City Art Institute and an MFA from the University of Kansas. Her work will also be featured in our upcoming spring exhibition, Compelling Ground. I had our uh, collections manager pull something special for the collection from 
or for us today. Uh, and before my career at the University of Museums began, I actually received my undergraduate degree in environmental science. And this is somebody who I've spent a lot of time studying and talking about, so I'm very excited to share him with you today. Um, during my time uh, studying environmental science, a lot of my professors were very interested in this person and the impact that they had on public discourse related to the environment and environmental protections. Um, he is also the person who would go on to basically establish the foundation for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Who is the artist I'm speaking of? Uh, that is Ding Darling, of course. Uh, his full name is Jay Norwood Darling, but he was better known as Ding, so I will probably refer to him as Ding or Darling through the rest of this so video. Ding was born in 1876 in Norwood, Michigan. His family at an early age packed up and actually moved to Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, from an early age, Ding fell in love with Iowa's natural landscape uh, and the inhabitants of wild prairies, its rolling hills and wetlands. Uh, and overall, Ding claimed Iowa as his true home. By the early 1900s, Darling became a reporter and political cartoonist. Eventually, he became a top-ranking political cartoonist syndicated in 130 daily magazines and newspapers, and he reached an audience of millions with his cartoons. Um, his cartoons were often noted for their wit and political satire. He was awarded a Pulitzer Prize in 1923 and in 1934 was named the best cartoonist by the country's leading editors. If, a comics, if comics was his profession, uh, conservation and politics were his uh, abiding passions. So the artwork that I'd like to talk about specifically um, that Ding created is for the first federal duck stamp. And what we have here is a early sketch of what the artwork would go on to be. Uh, this one's really quite fun because it is double-sided. So we have one side that is just the ducks, uh, pencil marks really light in the background and then gone over in pen. And then on the other side, which is a little bit more complete, has the landscape in the background. It looks like we're at a wetland. And what's really remarkable is um, it's pen. And we can see these white smudges all across the paper. And that is actually, it looks like to me, white out. Uh, and he's just gone over the areas where he didn't like um, his pen marks and kind of changed his mind, making things more of a negative space uh, by getting rid of his pen marks. So we have two ducks here. Uh, I personally took an ornithology class, so my best estimate is that these are mallard ducks. How do I know that? Well, mallard ducks, specifically the males, have a colorful head. Uh, in this case, it's just black ink, but because it's such a solid line and covers the area where um, colorful feathers would be, I would assume it's a male mallard duck. We also have the typical wing bands um, of color as well. So my assumption would be that this is a female mallard duck um, because they're often found in pairs and she's displaying less of the color patterns that we would see in a male mallard duck. So two mallard ducks over a wetland. Thanks for joining us on this virtual art walk. Uh, the three artists we learned about today showed us that nature can be uh, a raw material and the canvas as their partner. We have just scratched the surface of the environmentally conscious art in the University Museum's vast art on campus collection. Next time you are on campus, keep an eye out for the artworks that we mentioned today. Or better yet, see if you can discover nature-inspired artworks that we didn't have a chance to explore. I think you'll be surprised. Thank you for joining me on this tour, and I hope you've gained some insight on how artists seek to represent nature, whether that be as pristine visions of unspoiled beauty or fraught relationships with plants, animals, and the environments surrounding them. Join us next time for our Art Walk on Mythology.